to do one chapter tonight. Father, thank you for your word. Um, all of it. Thank you that no matter what passage we open up, no, no matter what chapter, what book, what verse, um, it's your word, it's living, and it speaks to us. And so, Lord, give us ears to hear. Uh, help us to hear and believe whatever it is that you would say to us through it. Um, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're at a point where the children of Israel are still relatively newly freed people from being slaves after uh, a long period of time. Uh, it's only, uh, I think, a month or so after they'd been free. That was the time marker in the previous chapter. Um, they've been miraculously saved by the power of God from Egypt. They've been miraculously saved from the Egyptian army trying to come and either get them back or take them out by God, you know, parting the Red Sea. They walked on dry ground to get uh, away from them. They've uh, begun to realize that God is going to lead them in a, in a visible manner in the wilderness, pillar by pillar of cloud by day, a, a pillar of fire by night. They've, they've come, they, they uh, have moved at least once from one place to another, and they, they were in a place called the wilderness of sin. And when they were there, they learned that God would provide water for them and food miraculously in, in, in the wilderness of sin. Specifically, they, they were given the miracle food, manna, and that was just the beginning. They, this is going to be their, their food for a long time to come. So that kind of brings us up to speed to, to 17, verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel sent, set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. And so here, uh, another, you know, remember, they move when the cloud moves. They move when the pillar moves. And so God is leading them again to a new place from the wilderness of sin to this new place called Rephidim. Rephidim means resting places. And so, you know, you think of it like they're, uh, they're on this journey, they're on this road trip, and they don't really know where they're headed yet. They're out in the middle of nowhere, and God gives them a rest stop, sort of, so to speak. Kind of like when you're on some crazy long drive, you know, from here to Southern California, or, or you know, what is it, Highway 8 that goes across? Is that the one that's like crazy long, or is it 10? that goes across Arizona and New Mexico. It's like just endless. A rest stop is a beautiful thing uh, when, when, you, when you're able to do that. It's sometimes uh, it's nice to see it. But there, there's just one big problem with this particular rest stop with Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink. And so um, it's called resting places, but how much rest can you really get when you're super thirsty, when you're dehydrated? Um, and so Rephidim was like that, no water to drink. And, and uh, it's interesting because we know how they got there. We know why they're in Rephidim, which is a resting places lacking drinkable water, at least at the, from the, uh, initially so. They're there, the same reason why they've been anywhere. They're being led by God. God led them to this place. And, and uh, this is the second time that we read about God leading them somewhere that is difficult. He led them, remember when they left Egypt, he led them to this place that, was a, that seemed like there was no way out. You know, the mountains on one side, the desert on one side, the sea on one side, and the Egyptian army on one side. And, and God led them to that. And now here God leads them to this place. It's called resting places, but there's nothing to drink. And uh, we mentioned then, and I think it's still the same thing here, is that they're, they're, God's doing this to teach them how to depend on him, to teach them how to trust him. They're, they're in a sense like new believers. They knew who God was before, but this is where their personal relationship with him is really, you know, uh, started. And, and one of the most basic things that God wanted them to learn and he wants us to learn is that we just 
need to trust him. We need to depend on him all the time, no matter what the scenario is. And learning that is not a one-time lesson. You don't learn that one time. You don't learn that. We, we, nobody does. Nobody goes through one test and one trial and, and they get it all, you know, they ace it and God's like, okay, I never have to test your faith again. I never have to do, that never happens. There's always opportunity. Some of them look similar. You know, some of them like you, you go through, the, some of them are similar. You go through the same test on multiple occasions because it's like God knows. Maybe you feel like you did okay on it, but God knows. You, you need to go through that again. I want you to really get this. And so there's lots of circumstances in our lives where we either uh, look to and trust in the Lord or things are just going to be really hard. They're hard even if we have to look to and trust the Lord, but they're harder if we don't learn that lesson. Uh, and so learning to depend on God, it can be hard because naturally speaking, we don't want to have to do that. We don't want to live by faith. We want to live by sight. We want to live by reserves. We want to live by like, I got, you know, stuff to fall back on. I got money in the bank. I got, you know, whatever. But God wants us to learn how to trust him. So sometimes he just leads us right into a place where it's like, that's our only option. Either I'm going to trust God or I'm going to fall apart. Verse 2. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? So here we go again with the complaining. They're complaining. Um, and they're complaining to Moses. He's the one that receives their complaints. He's their visible leader. He's the one that gets it. And, and they're, what are they saying to him? What are they complaining about? Give us water. Now, clearly they need water. But to complain to him as if somehow he's hiding water somewhere, as if somehow, you know, he's got a secret stash or he knows a, a secret, you know, water fountain out there in the desert or, you know, or something like that. And he just hasn't let them know because that's what they're saying. Give us water, you know, like like somehow he has it. And uh um, and that it's kind of lame. Just because he's in charge, it, or in a sense, he's not really in charge, he's leading. He's the guy leading. He's the one that goes out in front. Uh, that doesn't mean he knows everything. And, um, but God knows, knows uh, our needs. He knows where we can have our needs supplied and fulfilled. And they really should have been, if anything, I'm, okay, fine, talk to the leader. But instead of just demanding and barking like you have to solve this problem for us you know at least ask or you know uh if anything else hey you know how you're real close with god and the whole rod thing and the red sea can you help us out here with the water but no they just they just go straight to complaining and and here's how moses responds to the complaint this time he's not as gracious as he was the first time so, you know, he's a, he's, he's a human. He's, he's, not bad. he's not, not bad what he does here. But the first time he was so gracious, this time he's like, don't look at me, man. You're barking up the wrong tree. Why are you contending with me? And then he adds to that, and why are you tempting the Lord? And the idea there is kind of like, you're, God doesn't like your complaining. And by you acting like this, you're kind of you're kind of testing him. You're kind of like, you know, in a sense, you're kind of uh, potentially asking God to, you know, correct you, and it won't be fun. And so uh, you're barking up the wrong tree, whining to me, and you're not really doing a good thing in terms of complaining overall because it might it might not go well. Sometimes we need to be remembered. We need to be reminded of that. It's so easy as humans to just want to find somebody to blame, right? Just We just want to find somebody to blame, somebody to, you know, complain to. And uh, we're just so good at that. It's clearly something that's in, this, in, the, in the selfish nature because Adam and Eve did it. And everybody since then, at some, to some degree, and uh, uh, 
and it's when that happens, Moses gives a really good answer here. He, he's like, you're barking up the wrong tree with me. I'm not the one to complain to. And, and by the way, what about God? You know, he's, he's the one that uh, you're tempting. And, and by bringing God into it, it reminds them that, you know, God, God here is your provider. He's perfectly able to take care of this. And uh, anyway, once again, uh, we see that Moses has a pretty tough job, you know, being the head guy there. And, uh, but because despite the fact that it wasn't his responsibility to get water, it's not really on him. He still has to hear about it, you know, and, and, and that's hard. Like, are you going to sit there? I mean, he says it, but they're still going to come to him and whine to him again and again. Uh, anyway, verse 3, And the, the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you've brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And Moses is like, You're on to me. You got me. My plan's been foiled. That's exactly what I was going to do. I brought you out here so you could all die of thirst. Uh, but, but here's what's interesting. So here's kind of the detail of the complaint. And it's so, so similar to the last one, right? That last time, you just brought us out here to kill us. There's not enough graves in Egypt. This is what you brought us out here for. You know, they're going to kill us out here. And, and it's almost exactly, you just brought us out here to have us die of thirst. And, and uh, complaining is something that if you don't guard yourself from it, it's so, it so easily can become habitual. And it always sounds the same. Ask anyone who hears you're complaining a lot. Do I say this a lot? And if you do, they'll probably be like, yeah, like all the time. <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't really sound different despite the subject matter. It's just always, well, they and this and that and wah. And, and, uh, and it just doesn't change. And uh, that ought to give us a clue on how stupid it is, because if it doesn't change, what good did it do the first time? What good is it going to do this time? So verse 4, Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. So here again, we see the godliness of Moses as a leader. Um, he, there's other things he could have done in response. He could, have, he could have just went off on them. You know what? You know, uh, he is the boss. He could have like pulled rank and I don't know. I don't know what he could have done, but he's kind of the boss. And so uh, something else he could have done is just quit, just give up at this point. I'm out of here. You guys, I've had enough of you. But he, he doesn't, he, he, comes, he goes to the Lord with it, and, and that's just the right thing to do. That's the best thing to do. No matter, no matter if you want to quit or not, just go to the Lord with the issue. And the Lord spoke, said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So once again, the Lord has an answer. He provides for the children of Israel. He has a he has a provision that is clearly only from him. It couldn't come from any other way. There's this rock in Horeb in the wilderness. And interestingly, uh, verse 6, I, uh, the Lord's speaking, I will stand before you there on the rock. I'm going to stand on that rock. That's really interesting. I, I, it, it's, he says that's what he's going to do. It kind of makes you wonder, did they see him? Did anyone see him? Or was it just a faith? I don't know. But he says, I'm going to stand there. And he says, and then you need to strike it, and you need to do it in such a way that the guys that are with you, the leaders of Israel, see you doing it, and then water's going to come out of it. So that's his instruction. And there's no natural reason to think that would do any good. 
to think, oh yeah, of course, we forgot to strike the rock. There's no earthly reason to think that would do anything. But Moses, at least, among all these people, understands what the children of Israel need to learn, and that's that it doesn't matter if I understand it or not. It matters that I just, I'm following the Lord. That's what, we're, that's what we're doing now. That's what this life is. It's He's Lord. We're not. He commands. We obey. He leads. We follow. That's what this relationship is. And we do that even if we don't understand. We do that even if it doesn't make sense. And not because we're like mindless zombie robots, but because that's what trust is. You know, in the New Testament, we're, we're, we're told that it's a childlike faith that, the God, that God's looking for. Kids don't understand hardly anything that the mom and dad do, but they, they're there, they go, and that's kind of, this is their, their new believers, in a sense, again. And so Moses, uh, he, if you were to ask Moses at this point, how exactly is that going to work? He probably would have said, I don't know. But he did it. And he did it in the sight of all the rest of the elders of Israel so that they would know our leader is trusting the Lord. Our, this guy is trusting God. And that's, that's what's getting us through all this. It's not him being like an amazing, you know, man with all kinds of charisma and like, you know, and he's just, it, he's, he's following God. And, um, uh, and that's important for anybody who leads anyone. You're a parent, you're a teacher, you're you know, a ministry leader of any kind, or you're just in charge for the day, whatever. Just openly obey. Obey in a way that it's clear that you are obeying. And, and let it be an example to others. So that's what Moses is doing. But this, this thing also teaches us a huge spiritual lesson. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So, this is the first time, it's the first time, it's not the only time, that they get water from this rock. And, and what we just read in 1 Corinthians 10 tells us something really crazy, as if hitting a rock and water coming out isn't crazy enough, but that rock followed them in the wilderness. And, and then it says that that rock was Christ. That somehow Christ manifested himself in the wilderness to the children of Israel, not as a man like he does in the New Testament, but as a rock. That is wild. And, and, it, doesn't, and it says that it followed him. Does that mean they could see it follow him? I don't know. I don't really picture it that way, but that doesn't mean the way I picture it is right. The way I've always pictured it is that the cloud moves, the pillar moves. They okay, everybody. Time to go. They get. They pack. They get moving. They stop at a new place, and all of a sudden they're like, "Hey, that rock's here again." That's how I picture it. Again, I don't know. Maybe they actually could see it scooting along behind them. that rock. Is that rock following us? And, uh, but but the the big deal is that these people, yes, they're in a wilderness. Yes, living in a wilderness is not ideal. That's not where people would necessarily choose to settle, you know, in a barren wasteland kind of area. But they have provision. They have supernatural, constant, regular provision, miraculously, all over the place, manna every day, a rock, a walking rock water fountain, and, and they're taken care of. Now, why did Moses have to strike it? Well, that's where the spiritual lesson comes in that speaks to us and, for, and you know, looks forward for them. And it says that that rock is Christ. 
And so it, it paints a picture for us. Our, we live in a, a barren wilderness of a world. We live in a spiritual wasteland right now. And, and there's nothing out there in this world that could sustain us and wipe us out really quickly. But Jesus gives us refreshment, just like the rock of Christ in the wilderness gave them refreshment, quenched their thirst where there was nothing else to, be, to quench it. That's, that's what Jesus does. He does that for us. But he didn't do that until he was struck. And that's a picture of his sacrifice, his crucifixion. He was struck. And so we know that's how it works as believers. First, Jesus is struck for us. Once and for all, he was. He went to the cross and gave himself as the perfect sacrifice. And once that happened, he pours water out, in a sense, in the form of the Holy Spirit. The, water, the Holy Spirit's often likened to water. And so it's a picture of that. And, and it's a picture so that now we can look back and go, wow, this Bible really has always just pointed to Jesus. It's always what it's done. It's always what God was intending to do. They didn't know how fully this picture was. They didn't know that. This actually happened for them. They actually, Moses actually struck the walk. Water, water actually came out, and the, the rock actually followed them around and sustained them for all that time. And so that was miraculous. But in addition to that, it points us to Jesus, that he was struck for us, and now he refreshes us. And he quenches every thirst we have in this wilderness of a world. Verse 7, so he called the, the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And so they, they gave the place a name, the naming of places, especially during these early times, uh, was a really important thing because it typically related to something they learned there, some experience that they had there, something that they needed to remember, a lesson. And, and throughout uh, the law, particularly in Deuteronomy, uh, three different times, chapter 6, chapter 9, and chapter 33, the, the Lord reminds them of this occurrence and when he does, he reminds them the water at Massa because he wants them to remember that. And what is it that they need to remember? They, they needed to remember that they were whining and complaining and going, is God with us or not? And then how did he, what did he do? He came through and went, how, how about some water out of a rock? And he wanted them to remember all of that. Because the, the word masa kind of relates to the complaining part, but you would never forget the time when Moses struck the rock and miraculously water just starts. You would never forget that. So the reminder really is about the name and all that happened there. We, we have to learn a lot as Christians. We have to learn to un. We have to unlearn a bunch of things that we typically thought before we knew the Lord. We have to learn better things. And, and uh, we don't want to forget those things. All, the, all those difficulties, all those tests, all those challenges that we go through. And, and even the part where we were like, didn't do well. Like where we freaked out. Or where we got really mad at God and didn't trust him. Or where we said, fine, and we purposefully, you know, rebelled for five minutes or five days or whatever it was. We need to remember all those. Because every time we think about those types of things, you know what's going to happen in the, in the, if we remember it correctly, it's going to happen the same way it happened here. In this memory, there's two, two, two key uh, uh, ca uh, characters. There's us, the people, what did we do? We complained and whined and offended God and tested him. God, what did he do? He blessed and showed grace and poured out water and blessing, even though we didn't deserve it at all. And it's always going to go that way. And we don't want to forget that. We don't want to forget. We don't want to just think. We want to remember both. It wasn't just that he 
showed blessing. It's that he showed blessing, and I didn't even deserve it. I deserved the opposite of it. Verse 8, and this is a new story. Verse 8, now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So they're still in the same place. And this is the first uh, post out of Egypt attack, you know, post-salvation attack on the children of Israel. And, and here's where they learn, and this is just one of the things they have to learn, every believer has to learn, is that being saved doesn't mean that uh, I don't have any enemies anymore. It doesn't mean that there's no hostility against me. You know, even though I'm, you know, out of the kingdom of darkness now where the devil, you know, had me in his grips and, or, you know, whatever he was doing in my life, doesn't mean that I don't have other enemies that want to come after me. And, and this one was from Amalek, or the Amalekites. And when it says came and fought here, it can literally be translated ambushed or attacked, ambushed. So this was an ambush. They're just, you know what an ambush is. You don't know it's coming. You're just cruising along, and all of a sudden you're surrounded and being attacked. Amalek was the grandson of Esau, the, the brother of Jacob, who we know now is Israel. And so th these people are uh, relatives of the children of Israel. And um, just like Esau didn't get along with uh, Jacob, the, his descendants didn't get along with the children of Israel. And so here they are, and they attack. It's noteworthy, really, when this attack happened. This attack happened right after a huge blessing. This attack happened right after God came and poured, showered, literally showered a blessing of water for the people. And, and it was coming off a spiritual high, a, spirit, a, a great blessing that they were attacked. And it probably, from the perspective of the Amalekites, it probably was something like this. You know, here's the Amalekites. They live out in this area. Here's this huge group of people, you know, the children of Israel traveling through this wilderness area. It's a scarce, it's a barren wilderness area. Water's scarce. Um, so anytime there's water, you know, the people out there have to compete for it in a sense. And whoever has it is going to be strong and survive. And whoever controls it is going to have great advantage. And so maybe from their perspective, and, and from the perspective of we certainly don't want this group of people taking the water and being strong and having advantage around here, so we better do it before they do. We better attack them while they're weak. That's probably how, it, from their perspective, why they did it. But the main thing is, is that they did it. And they, like I said, they did it after a blessing, after a victory, after something great happened in the Lord. And, and that's something that uh, is a reality as well. The, this, this literal story, it actually happened, provides a spirit, another spiritual il illustration for our lives. You know, we're saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live in our lives and gives us refreshment, uh, fountains of living water flowing in, into our lives. When we submit our lives to the Lord, we're refreshed, refreshed, and it's the greatest blessing there is to begin that life. But we soon find out that we're, we're uh, attacked right after the blessing happened. I mean, it doesn't take long. And, it, and that's not the only time. It's not only when you first get saved that you get attacked. It's just so common that right after you get blessed, right after you go to a retreat and you, there's a, you just feel like you really met with God and you made, some, you made some commitments and you prayed some promises and you, you, know, you know, made some vows and you repented of some sins and this was great get home and it all just you just realize oh it's all ugly again you got you got people you got your own you're like you committed you knew that you weren't going to do that anymore and when you got home you were going to throw some things away and clean some things up and you were going to do that and then you get home and it's like right there and and uh it that's that's not uncommon or it's like even new year's I, new year's a good time to make some vows there's nothing wrong with that you know why not? If anything, if there's, if there's a calendar day that makes you go, oh, yeah, we should try to make some changes, good, do it. And so you do it, and you're committed, and you're going to read through the Bible, and you're not going to miss church as often as you used to, and all 
things, and then, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get there, and you're gonna you're really gonna be there for the worship, and you're gonna you know treat the worship like it's just as much a part of the service as the sermon is, and you're gonna do that, and you're gonna just this is what you're gonna do, and then here comes this attack, and the attack it's an ambush. You're you're not like you're thinking you know a lot of times we think the attack is gonna be some sort of like you know, some obvious demonic kind of thing. But usually it's just something from behind. It's like, and when, when they're ambushing them, and we have more details on that, in Deuteronomy 25, it says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt? How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks? All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear the Lord? That's how the attack comes. The attack isn't going to come right up to you and confront you to your face and, you know, you're, you're already reading your Bible and praying and, and he comes right at you and goes, you want to fight right while you're in like a really good place worshiping and, and, you know, having a good quiet time and good devotion. He's going to sneak up behind you, get you in your weakest area. You know, he's going to, he's going to come and like distract you somehow with your kids or your you know, your elderly uh, relatives that are sick or, you know, someone at work that is just a flake and it's just going to happen in some weak area. And it's going to, and it's going to come at you at that, not announced, not at your strength, but in an ambush right after you've made some great commitment or had some great blessing. That's how it works. That's how it works. And for some reason, we're always surprised still, Right? Wait, why am I being attacked on my way to church? Because you're on your way to church. (laughs) That's why. Why am I being attacked on my way home from church? Man, that was a, I I heard God speak to me in that worship set. Man, I really connected with God today. Why am I being attacked after that? Because that's how the enemy works. It's an ambush. Your flesh, and it's sometimes the attack, you know, sometimes, a lot of times you can think of Amalek not as, uh, you know, uh, Egypt and Pharaoh can be more likened to the devil, and Amalek, in a sense, can be more likened to your own flesh. And your flesh, you're like, your heart and your spirit and your mind's like, oh, man, I am, I'm okay. I heard what was said today. I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to walk in what God spoke to me. And, And your flesh is going, oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. Verse 9, And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Moses wisely understands this is something we have to deal with. This is something we have to resist. This isn't something we can ignore or, you know, hope goes away. This is something that we have to get involved in. We have to fight. We have to, we have to resist. And, and this is something that's going to take a group effort. It's not just, you know, it's not just me this time. Like, for whatever reason, the Red Sea was just Moses raised the rod. But this time, there's going to be more involved. And, so, and there's different aspects of this battle. And so there's the, there's the like, face-to-face fight, man-to-man fight of the battle. Joshua's going to be the leader of that. He's going to be the guy that actually goes and physically has the fight. Moses' part here is equally important. He's the one fighting the spiritual battle, using the spiritual resources and weapons that he has. For him, it's the rod that God gave him. He's going to be up high on the hill, kind of representing get, being close to God while they're down in the valley fighting. And both are involved, no, one, uh, no less part of the fight, but, but different aspects of it. And when we're attacked or ambushed or whatever, by whether it be the devil or the flesh, we have to respond, just like Moses, we have to. It's not going to just go away. The, the, your flesh and the devil doesn't fight fair. Oh, he doesn't want to fight today. Okay, I'll come back tomorrow and see if you're in the mood. If you're not in the mood, that's the perfect time for the flesh and the devil. He's like, all right, we got a sucker. And our response is not panic. 
It's not self-pity. It's not, you know, give up. It's we have to face things. We have to actually resist whatever is coming at us, the sin, the temptation, the lie. And we have to resist spiritually and that's, where Mo, that's what Moses represents here, getting high up in a sense, close to God. And, and so Moses knew what to do right away, and that, that was key to the fight. He was ready, and, and he acted. Verse 10, so, Moses, so Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. So Moses' role in this battle with the rod of God in his hand lifted up, uh, high up on top of this hill. The, the uplifted hands of Moses can be seen or re representative of prayer in the spiritual battle. Here's why. It says it in a couple places. Uh, Psalm 28.2 says, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry out to you when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So there's something to the lifting of hands in prayer. Uh, it, it doesn't make your prayers more magically effective, but uh, it's a posture and a position that is, refers to prayer. So we're, Moses kind of gives us a picture of that. And so... Here's how the people of God respond to this attack. There's an actual physical resistance in the form of Joshua and the men with him. You have to actually resist it. And at the very same time, there's the Moses and his men trusting God, believing God, and believing that by reaching out to God in, in, in their sense with the rod, in our sense with prayer, it does something. Both of those need to be done in resisting an attack. We can't just pray and not resist. You know, that, that we have to pray and resist. Okay, God, if you don't want me to do this, you have to make it go away. There's so many, that is such a futile prayer. God, just Make me not sin like this again. I'll just sit here and wait until you make it go away. That is not how it works. We have to pray and resist. And then we have to resist and pray. You can't just white knuckle, clench your teeth together and go, I'm just not going to this time. I'm not. While having no quiet time, while having no prayer life, you have to do both. We have to do both. The, the success in this battle was dependent upon the battle in, in person in the valley with the fighters and the battle up on the hill in prayer. Both. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took up a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Moses, he's old. He's, he's diligently, fervently doing his part. He's engaged in the battle as much as he could be, but he's a mere man. And, it, you know, we have limitations. And his limitation became apparent. He can't do this all by himself. And, and that means if, if we're going to look at Moses as uh, him lifting up his hands as a picture of prayer, that, that shows us that the, the guy, even the leader can't be the only one praying. If the battle needs a lot of prayer, then there needs to be a lot of people praying, not just one person praying a lot. And, and so there needs to be prayer teams and prayer support and prayer partners. I, I so appreciate the men on Monday night and the women on Saturday morning that are praying for the needs of the church and the people that come and pray before the service on Sunday morning. That, that, there's something happening there. There's, there's a lot of support going on 
for this church, for this ministry, for me, for my family, for the other people serving in this church. Uh, without that, it would be the equivalent of just going, I just can't do it anymore. We're being undergirded by the prayers of the people, and that's how it's supposed to be. Moses was the leader. Moses, God, God used Moses in a way that, you know, I don't know if anybody else was used the way Moses was. But he, he didn't have it all in himself. And so uh, these other guys, they, Aaron and her, they, they got a rock. They propped him up. They held his arms up for him. They, they were giving him the support. And one more thing about that is that he, it never says he asked for that. Now, it wouldn't have been wrong for him to ask for that. It doesn't say he didn't ask for it, just to be fair. But it doesn't say he did. And the way I think of it, the way I read it, is they saw the need. Aaron and her saw the need. And they said, let's go support him. And uh, there's nothing wrong with asking for prayer. We should, if you need it. We should, we should be close enough to people to, to ask for prayer when we need it. But equally, we shouldn't wait to be asked for prayer to pray for somebody who looks like they need prayer. You see someone who needs prayer support, get in there. You know, give them some relief. And this is how, this is how the story shows it. They, they steadied him in prayer. And so there was the victory. I, I know I'm being prayed for. You know, I, I, I don't know. I'm not real... Uh, I don't know what the word is. Mysteri- mis- mysti- mysterious, mis- I don't know. But I can feel it sometimes. I'll, I'll like come in here and I'm like coming in here. I can feel the drag of, you know, oppression against me because I know that the word of God being preached is a important and powerful thing. We have an enemy that hates it. And there's just times where I'll get in the pulpit. I don't feel it all the time. It's not like, it's not like I just feel electricity running it's not like that it's nothing weird but like just all of a sudden i'm like just i'll realize whatever ha- whatever was going on whatever drag was happening before i got in the pulpit it is gone and i feel like so i don't know and i know that's because some some people are praying for me so joshua defeated amalek and his people with the edge of the sword that's the 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 victory came because they resisted in the valley with the sword and they uh, prayed with the rod on the mountain. Both were needed and that's how, we, uh, def- that's how we have victory over our flesh, over the attacks of the enemy. Here's something from 2 Corinthians 10. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That's how we have victory. We have victory that way. We have victory from Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. We stand by putting on the whole armor of God. We have victory through the word of God. We have victory through prayer. We need all these things to, pre- to prevail. Uh, prayer changes things. It changes us, how we're facing whatever we're dealing with. It changes attitudes. It changes our view on things. It changes us so that we're going from fear and faith and panic to, to faith and trust. It changes other people. God will dispatch help. We don't see it, but when you pray, God will send angels to fight for you. I, I'm convinced of that doesn't matter if we see it or not. And, uh, and then we have our sword, the word of God. And so that's, the, that's how they prevailed. That's how we prevail. Verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And so God tells them, I want you to remember this victory uh, and, and part of it, and it says, recount it in the hearing of Joshua. And that would be important because Joshua's going to have a lot more battles ahead of him. 
you know, the book of Joshua tells about how they go into the promised land and they start conquering the place. And Joshua was the leader to that. And so there's going to be other battles. So he needs to have, a, uh, he needs to keep this in his memory, you know, uh, in not far in the back of his mind, close at hand to remember, because this is the first one. And he needs to be able to go into every single one of them trusting the Lord. But then he also uh, says that, that part of the memorial is that, uh, that God says, I'm going to utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek. They, uh, don't worry. I'm going Because they just won the battle. They didn't wipe out the Amalekites. But God, but God says he's going to. And he says, write it down. So this is a prophecy. It doesn't get fulfilled for a, quite a long time. And it doesn't get fulfilled when it could have gotten fulfilled because the first person who's supposed to fulfill it is King Saul. But he fails at it, and that's why he gets in trouble. But even despite all that, God still fulfills it. Uh, he fulfills his word whether we're on board with him or not. Verse 15, And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner, for he said, Because the Lord is sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And so that's interesting because it says the Lord will have war with Amalek. It's the Lord that, it's, his, it's really his battle when it's against his people. And it's his victory. And it's his victory through his word. And so uh, they, they needed, again, they needed to have this reminder and this altar and this, you know, remembrance because of all the all the battles that would come ahead and that's why we read it because we have them and and the way they won is the same way we win the way we continue on is the same way they continued on lord thank you once again for your word thank you that the battle belongs to the lord thank you that our victory is uh in, your, in doing things your way. Thank you that the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're mighty in God for pulling down stronghold. Thank you that, they, that you tell us to resist the devil and then you give us the ability to do it through prayer, through trusting your word, through uh, uh, supporting each other as Aaron and her did. And Lord, help us to do these things. Help us to see the great victory you want to give us over our flesh, over uh, am uh, satanic ambushes. want to trust you and see these victories in your name, in Jesus' name.